sound engineers, projection artists, programmers, um, just a large creative team makes possible the kind of installation that you're going to see uh, if you come back in the evening on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday from 7.30 until 10.30 p.m. So Space Messengers actually was born from the pandemic. It was, we were, we meaning myself as an artist and all of my students because I work with youth and I develop youth workshops that combine art, science, and technology. And during the pandemic, we were all locked down and we were planning to go to CERN to visit Steve. And we were gonna bring the whole classroom over there. And they were going to um, see my art installation there and present on everything they've learned through our workshops that Steve and I do together. And so they, it was all canceled and I had to come up with an idea of how I can engage them that could compete with going to Europe and going to CERN and, and so forth. So I came up with the idea to start an international youth exchange program and I found 30 students, a school in Portugal, thanks to the US Embassy here, and 30 students, our students from Taos, and together with the uh, Escuela Secundaria Sebastião e Silva, <laughs> de Silva um, and Tisa, they actually, for seven weeks, every week, and Catarina was also part of it. So in addition to the creative team that I mentioned, there's also an interdisciplinary team of educators that work with the students. We had Catarina, who was uh, sharing philosophy, art, and science. We had Steve, who was doing uh, particle physics. We had a Native, um, Native American uh, sharing Native science and um, space science. They learned about space. So all of us, for seven weeks, we worked together sharing with the students. And at the end, they contributed their messages. We call them space messages and you will be seeing all of their thoughts and their wishes for a sustainable interplanetary future, which was the question that we posed to them. How would you imagine your future? And after learning the science behind all of these different fields. So what we're going to be presenting is a projection that's gonna fill the courtyard, and the courtyard, as you come in, has two walls here and here, and then there's going to be interactive areas so you can interact, and you'll be seeing all of the messages of the students, and you'll be able to send your own space messages to the youth. So, in a nutshell, that's space messengers. Yes. And how uh, came that you have worked together? How, tell us the story, how you yeah, start collaborating. <laughs> I'll tell this. <you. laughs> I, I think, well, the primary connection Agnes and I have many connections right, over time. <laughs> the primary connection is with students, right? So uh, I spent a lot of time doing particle physics at CERN, mm -hmm. and one of the major questions that is always raised is, why are, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this sort of esoteric work of trying to understand what our universe is made out of and, and, and what we're made out of? Uh, and the people who I've found over time I enjoy explaining that to are the students. And so I spend a lot of time talking to students, going to classrooms. And Agnes contacted me one time uh, because she had a classroom full of students. What I like to do with a classroom full of students, even though we're across the ocean from them, is to give them a view, a, a, a nice visual tour of our experiment. Mm -hmm. We're scientists. Scientists like to show off their stuff. And we've got some really nice stuff that we've built in order to do searches, like for the Higgs boson. It's an enormous, beautiful detector underground, and by showing this to the students, you just have to show it to them. I hardly have to talk, right? Um, they, they get very excited and they ask questions about science. And the same comes with, um, with art, right? So we connected very quickly on that. I, her classroom asked questions and, and, and talked to me. I made a trip over to meet these brilliant students who she's making more and more brilliant every day, I think, um, and getting them to convey their understanding of the universe, which goes well beyond particle physics. It includes aspects of culture, of, of philosophy, and being able to express that through art. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe the 12-year-old isn't going to write down equations for me, but they can express it. They can say their words and, and, and make art. And the tools 
uh, which they got to use, uh, Marcus's tools that you helped them to, to use, uh, were fantastic. So the kids really could express what they learned about our universe through this. So that was our main, that was the connection, that was what brought me to. We share uh, the common interest in working with youth because we both believe they're the future and they're the ones that really have the capacity at this to, to change, you know, to change the world view, to change, to, to mm -hmm. be more open to new ways of, of doing things. They give me hope. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you both um, understand science and art as a tool for upgrading the world, changing and the upgrading the world, right? You have this. Upgrading. Upgrade. We're upgrading. I, th I think that's a, that's a good way to put it. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think we, I think more than a tool, I think it's, it's something which is um, fundamental to all of us. I think we're all born artists and scientists. You know, we're all amazed we look at things and we, we want to share those things. And when we're a little kid, we want to draw and show this and, and show something off. And, and in the end, both aspects of us are, are doing the same thing. We're looking at the world around us, trying to understand it, and then conveying what we've learned to our local world, the people around us. Mm -hmm. And we're both doing this now maybe to a bigger audience, uh, but that's what it's all about. And I think that's something that's fun. You know, human beings, you know, we, we eat, we, we make babies, and we explore the world around us. That's, this is our DNA. Yeah. And so I think that came together uh, with our exploration through art and, and, and science. Mm -hmm. And how was your um, collaboration? How did you work? Like, as a scientist and you as an artist, how did you connect in practical terms? I mean, mm -hmm. how did you work practically? Yeah. How did you put that in, a, in your practice? How did um, well, I, I like to work in an interdisciplinary way, so I, I like to stretch and, and uh, work with people from different disciplines. So, and science in particular is something that's very important to me. So developing science literacy so I'm always looking for opportunities to reach out to scientists and work. So how we work together is very, um, it's very creative. And I think what makes it possible for us to work in a, in a way that's interdisciplinary is that we share a common goal. You know, we both are going to the same place. We want to find new ways to communicate, to explore the universe through science or through art. So in other words, we're both trying to explore the universe, whether you're an artist or you're the scientist. Yeah. And I think that that is where we, we, that's the excitement we bring to the kids, that we want to understand the world around us and we want to do it through the amazing world of science. And we want to also do it through the amazing world of art, because art is not just a communication tool but it's also a way of thinking it's also a way yes. of understanding yeah. and thinking so um, we talk about this a lot how mm -hmm. science is not just a tool it's a way of thinking and art is the same thing so when I when I share my art with the students I tell them that yes art can decorate it can decorate your house and it can be a painting behind your couch but it can also be a tool for changing the world, you know, it can be a tool for raising awareness. And that's the kind of art I tell them that we're going to be exploring, you know, how can we take ideas and communicate those ideas to the world in a way that has impact. So one of the things that I uh, always focus on is artistic literacy, science literacy and humanistic literacy. So it's like, how are we applying art and science to make the world a better place? Yes, in fact, I was uh, hearing you and I was thinking about an article in Nature that has been published recently, like in the beginning of this year. And they have made um, this pool, this, uh, how do you say, um, a poll. A poll? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. A poll, mm -hmm. yeah. About in, in, asking scientists and artists about the relationship between science and art mm -hmm. and what uh, they thought about it. And one of the things that uh, was most important in that article is precisely the idea that art should not be used by science only for communicating science or for utilitarian uh, pur purposes, mm -hmm. but art had that um, capacity to make us understand what science is mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. and, and, and also, and uh, science has the capacity to understand what art is. Mm 
mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they both can co-create and they both can be a way of understanding each other. Yeah. Yes, so that's, mm -hmm. I was hearing you and I, was, I completely agree <laughs> and I, that's, mm -hmm. uh, and what, what, what do you think about it? I, so I guess that you are also, that you agree, but <laughs> I would love to have. No, to no I, think, I think that Agnes touched on a really important point, which was the goal. I think that you like to be interdisciplinary and that you saw um, we had common goals of reaching out to the, to the children, but just of describing the world. And because I do remember when I heard you asking that question, how did this come about? I, I remember sitting on the flight, and it's a long flight from Geneva going over to Albuquerque or wherever I flew in. Thinking, what am I doing? <laughs> what, is, what are we going to do? How is this going to work? In practical terms, how do we, how do we yeah. work together? And, um, and I, I worried not so much because I knew that we had that goal. And the moment we got together, things could work because we were focused on a goal. And it, it made me think also of the situation I'm in when, when I'm working uh, in Geneva at CERN we have a huge international collaboration to build these enormous detectors. Uh, there's 5,000 of my best friends uh, who I work with who helped to build this entire thing as our collaborations, and they're from every place around the world, everywhere you can imagine. And I thought about that because, indeed, that's a collaboration. We come together, we have an idea what we want to do, but we don't know exactly how we're going to do it. Everybody brings to the table their different aspects. And so to me, being able to meet with Agnes was just yet another chance of, of learning a different point of view, mm -hmm. uh, another cultural background mm -hmm. that could help think and try to come up with solutions. And it's been amazing, it really has. Yes, and you are both linked to the cultural dimension of science and of art, right? Mm -hmm. you, are, you have that also that uh, preoccup preoccupation and uh, activism, may I say, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's the humanistic part and yeah. yeah. The contact not only with the students, but the contact with community in general. Mm -hmm. So well, when the, when the artwork is, the kind of art that we do is interactive with the public. So the final stage of this whole project is that the final piece is not something that's static. It's what's called participatory art. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that it's not complete until the audience participates. And so what the audience will be experiencing is that they get an opportunity to read the messages of the students, which are their, the science that they learned. Um, you'll see Steve pop in their little videos of you and Steve and all the speakers that were sharing their knowledge with the students. So the audience, watches, reads, listens to all of this, and then has the opportunity to respond and write their own message. What, what message do you want, or what advice, or what hope do you want to share with our future leaders? And um, this is your chance to tell them. And th when you speak to them, you're not just speaking to the students that participated in this workshop, because Space Messengers is launching here for the first time but it's actually going to travel around the world. And everywhere we go, we'll do another workshop with another 60 students, and next we're going to Mexico, and then to Germany, and you know, on and on. And so basically it's a database of messages that are being collected, and so your, the audience, becomes part of that database. And these are just messages from youth leader and to our youth leaders of the future. So it's a participatory experience. So our hope is that we're impacting the youth, but we're also impacting our communities because then they get to experience what we experienced and what the students experienced. And hopefully we'll be developing a, a, a curiosity and an interest and a willingness to explore science more deeply and to explore art more deeply. And ha have you found any uh, difficulties, uh, I mean, dif methodologically speaking, like the, the, we know about the scientific methods and we know about artistic practices, they are so different. And when you work together, have you found uh, any kind of difficulty in, in, in language, for instance, in, concept, in conceptual uh, understanding of the work or, uh, I don't know, any kind of difficulties? 
Well, artists are strange people, so it took, it took me, artists are very strange people, so it took, <laughs> no, but ser seriously, um, <laughs> of course, I, I think that, you know, some vocabulary we had to learn from each other, um, and the concept of our target. There are differences, somewhat. Um, I'm, although Agnes is, is much more scientific than, than I had originally thought it would, it would be like, in, in other words, for me, one of the hardest things I can do is to uh, engage the public in front of my colleagues because I have to be exact. Okay. We're, we're people who don't like to, as scientists, be almost right. Uh, it has to be accurate. And so when we're doing a depiction of anything, whether it be in the art or, or whether I'm explaining something um, to, the, to the students, it has to be correct. But it doesn't mean it doesn't have to be fun, right? Yes. And so I think that we definitely found a good balance for that. And, and Agnes was already, already concerned that whatever messages she was putting forward would be accurate. So she spent a lot of time interrogating me, asking me questions about the science that, that uh, I could explain. And then I asked about the art because I wanted to learn how, you know, how, does he, how do you express these things? So, so I think there was, there was learning uh, but much more similarities, I think, than, than differences. Yes, precisely, because you both are sensible, like you are a sen scientist sensible to art, you are an artist sensible to science, mm -hmm. but what have you learned from art, from Agnes, and what have you learned from science, from mm -hmm, Stephen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, to continue what he was saying, I think when I think about the challenges, and always it is the challenge, is that because science is so precise and must be communicated accurately so that we don't have things that happen where science is misconstrued and you know misinterpreted and, and so forth. And what that's what we're all about is science literacy. So how do you communicate science accurately but do it through art which is much more interpretive? And so <laughs> that's always the challenge and a challenge that I love, right? So always trying to find ways to do that. And um, yeah, so I, I, I often text Steve, is this mm. accurate? Is this accurate? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, your installation that you did at CERN, you, you interrogated many <laughs> yes. scientists to get this artwork correct, which, which yeah. of course, we really appreciate it, because that's not always the case. Someone might interpret something, and, mm -hmm. and not just a, an, an artist, but writers uh, make, pro they paint in broad strokes sometimes. And it's quite frustrating for us because we want people to, to you know, th there are other, there are others out there who don't necessarily want to hear the correct science. Yeah. And we see that especially these days. And so we're very careful now. Scientists are a bit frustrated by that. We work very hard in our work to find the truth. We have to go through hurdles that are extremely, that can be excruciating. You have to convince your own uh, people in your office first that what you're doing is right and then you have to convince a broader community and then your whole entire collaboration and then and then you submit to publishers the, the tasks we have to do to make a paper and put it out. It can, it can take years and it's a huge amount yeah. of time which is a bit more than say eating a cheeseburger and tweeting something. So that's one of the reasons that these days especially we've gotten very sensitive to making sure that things are done correctly. But if we were the ones that were doing the exhibit, it would be boring. So, <laughs> so we need people who know how to express and to make things reach into someone's uh, head and to their hearts uh, mm -hmm. through art uh, to be able to express these things well. So it, we have to work together to make that happen. Yeah, so you have, um, so for you, the idea of artists being in laboratories and, uh, or in the scientific milieu it's, it's a good thing also for scientists and mm -hmm. for science in itself. Yeah. And have, as a scientist, what have you learned uh, specifically? Like, okay, you, ha you were just explained that, but uh, uh, more than that, what uh, um, my question is like, when you do science, now forgetting your experience with Agnes, mm -hmm. the moment you are just scientists doing your job, does this experience have some impact in your uh, job, uh, in your practice as a scientist? Well, I say art, art in general, I mean, 
Absolutely. Uh, we're impacted by art. We are humans. We're scientists, but yeah. we are humans. <laughs> yeah. And we're impacted by art because it, t it touches us. And I think because I do a lot with classrooms, I think the impact that I can see with young students, too, is, is really important. It, because not just that they see it, but them making it, them creating art mm -hmm. uh, allows them to express. So if I had to wait and teach them the Lagrangian of the standard model and how to integrate, and, and you know, they wouldn't be able to get that out. Right? <laughs> if I had to give them a full lesson of quantum field theory, it would be too long for them to express what's on their mind. But through art, they can put it out right there. They can express what they learned immediately. Yeah. And so I, I've learned that that's, that that's a really good tool because again, art like science is something that's in us. It's something that we have, something we do. Yeah. And I've learned that that's, you know, the expression of it is something that's an amazing way for people to, to learn. And you, Agnes, you were also in, at CERN? Yeah, so I did a research uh, stay there, like a residency thing for two months, and Steve organized it. And that was in 2015. And before that, I was always inspired by particle physics. I would read every book I can read, but layman and not knowing the real science. And there's a lot of books out there that are pseudoscience, and I couldn't tell the difference anymore what was real science and what was not real science, what was theoretical, or I just did, I felt like I could not communicate the science correctly if I didn't understand it. So that's when I had asked Ariana Kirk, who was the director of the Arts at CERN program, if she could recommend a physicist that could work with me uh, and get first to do a research day so that I could like really go deep into learning the, the science that's done at CERN, and then to work with me on this project, which is the Projecting Particles project. So I really delved into, um, and at CERN was where I really got my crash course in <laughs> particle physics. And at CERN, you, you developed an, a different artwork, right? Another yeah, different yeah. Artwork. then years later, let's see, that 2015 is when we first did, I first did that research day. Mm -hmm. well, we were working before that, 2013, anyway, somewhere around there. And then in 2017 or 18, after I kept going back every year doing projects with Steve, we would do workshops with youth, and then I would go back and share my outcomes with the community. So we were doing this educational program back and forth, right? And then the Melissa uh, Gaillard, the marketing director at CERN Data Center, she saw my work and had been looking for an artist to do a permanent installation at the CERN Data Center, uh, which is where they process all the, the data from the, part, from the Large Hadron Collider. And they needed an installation in their stairwell that would visualize the data from the LHC. And she invited me to collaborate with scientists and engineers to design it. So it wasn't my, me alone, it was really a collaborative process because it had to be very accurate. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we worked together and designed um, the, the title of this piece is Fluidic Data. Mm -hmm. So that was my latest work that I did and then now we're doing Space Messengers together. And how was uh, the reception here in Portugal? I see that Anna is here. Anna Carvalho, which is a teacher of the Escola, I remind me the name, Escola Sebastião da Silva. And how was uh, the experience of working uh, with uh, the students here in Portugal? Uh, and, well, and in, in this context of pandemics and the virtual reality that we all shared uh, yeah. online. Well, Steve and I both it. experienced this, and you can talk about your experience with it, but it was beautiful. It was amazing to have um, 30 students from here and 30 mm. students from Taos. Every week, once a week, we'd meet. And during the pandemic, it was just a breath of fresh air to have. And the kids love to talk to kids from another country and to share and ex learn science in this way through virtually and through a different in through two countries and combining art, science, and technology. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, it was, it, was, it was really a pleasure uh, because the students, as always, students ask the best questions, the most profound questions yes. that make you really think yourself, and which are all often impossible to answer at the time, or at least not satisfactory, mm -hmm. um, but uh, really make you reflect.
and that's that, that's what I really appreciated. Those those students were brilliant. It's probably because of Anna, but they were they were brilliant. Yeah, Anna, uh, do you want to share uh, the impact of this uh, experience with your students? I I, I think there's a microphone. <laughs> the teacher that is uh, the coordinator for the Club de Ciencias Viva, uh, the nossa escola, of our school, she invited me to integrate the project. And Agnes, I, I'm so grateful, as you know. Thank you also to Stephen and to all the other uh, artists and uh, experts that were in our program. Thank you, Katerina. I think the most important thing that the, the students really enjoyed and they were amazed at was the fact that so um, empirically we think that they are completely different fields, arts, philosophy, science, and it seems that everybody is uh, alone in their own uh, separate group and it was amazing to see and for them too to have that experience that everybody can collaborate and bring their knowledge to the table and new ideas and new thoughts and the idea of thinking of what's the future going to be like, what kind of planet, what kind of world, what kind of planets eventually we can travel to and colonize and what, in what way can we do that and will we repeat the same mistakes that happened in the past and what kind of uh, futures and plans can we prepare and think of and also because of citizenship, which is in Portuguese we call cidadania, educação para a cidadania, and to have an active citizenship, uh, to make all the citizens uh, more active and to produce, come up with new solutions, new plans for jobs that still don't exist but will in the future, and to find solutions for problems that will appear in the future. And I think that this was amazing. And uh, seven weeks, and a few extra hours of work. They first they complained about that, but then now they say it was an amazing experience for them, and they learned so much, so many different skills. Uh, and I think they are looking forward to continue and to talk about the project to other students. Also, it also mm -hmm. happened last week, as you mm -hmm. uh, know. And other students now want to join the project, and also other teachers. And I think this uh, is very important. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would love to ask you also um, the conception that you have, because you are both uh, uh, linked to the um, education and to, to the students. So what's your idea for the future of education, of science and art? And uh, what would be the, the ideal school? And what can we do for that? I would like to see more of this kind of interdisciplinary yeah. work happening every day and uh, all throughout the year and not just as a special project. Mm -hmm. More teachers doing it, more educators doing this kind of integrative learning. That's, that would be my hope. Yeah. I think, yeah, there are a couple aspects, the integrative bit, but also the hands-on. Um, I, I don't think we get en enough of that in our schools. It makes a big difference if the students can take a day off from learning formulas or from you know, learning rules uh, and be able to talk to people who are doing the research, who are out there on the front lines to find out what it's like, what, it, what is it really like, and to ask the questions they have. Because it's, it's not that students don't want to learn. They have, they're full of questions. They have a lot of questions. They don't know who to direct them to. And so getting into classrooms, I think, is really, really important and we need to give teachers a bit more freedom. There are some who are good and can go forward and do this, but it's rare. A lot of teachers, I think, all around the world are constrained uh, that they have to, they're, they're, they're never paid enough. Anna will say yes, and <laughs> they're never paid enough, but they, they aren't given the resources enough and they're told this is what you've got to do, this is your curriculum and you got to be done by this time. They need more freedom to be able to use the skills they went and learned uh, to, to teach 
the, the students, and that would involve bringing in an artist, or bringing in a scientist, or, or, or whoever uh, to talk with the kids. They, they get a tremendous amount out of it. And yes. more arts integration. Mm -hmm. There's more? not more arts integration is needed like this. More, there's not enough integrated arts separated, the art class, the science right. class. If arts is integrated in all of the subjects as a way of expressing understanding, it's just so much more powerful. My hope yeah. is that there'd be more of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what about your view on philosophy? <laughs> like, do you, so it, we are talking about interdisciplinarity, we are talking mm -hmm. about science and art. Uh, I know I have collaborated in this project also, I've been a little part on it uh, with philosophy, but do you think that um, all this interaction between science and art is also a kind of, um, a kind of, uh, 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 originary world where science, art and philosophy were all together and make sense together. And that's the orig originary world, but that's also the future world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with me? With that? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to disagree with you here. No, but... I pay them. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but, but really, how, how do you... I mean, for, for the science part, how do I go and talk to them about the origins of the universe and what we're all made out of, and uh, you know, the, 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 where we're going, how we evolve, without philosophy coming in. Mm -hmm. you, you don't. We never have to. I don't think I ever had to ra raise the name of a philosopher during discussions. But <laughs> philosophy always comes up, and the, the same I, I, with, with art, yeah. right? Yeah, and I mean, the arts is always, for me anyway, the arts is philosophical. You're always asking deeper questions of where we come from and you know where we're going. So I think that philosophy is what I include when I say interdisciplinary and why I included it in this, this, in this workshop, which has to do with exploring the universe and where, where CERN is exploring where does the universe, where do we come from in terms of the materials that make up the universe. There's also the philosophical questions that come up. And then we also bring in uh, native science. And so we have Steve yes, Tamayo, yeah. who is the, uh, on the team and he comes and he talks to the students about uh, the perspective of exploring the universe through native culture. And Steve and I were just talking on the way over here now with native, uh, we're always trying to put it into, into boxes, you know, even as we speak saying, well, philosophy, Steve is talking about philosophy, but yeah, but he's also talking about science because native science is, doesn't have the distinctions. Mm -hmm. So even the word native science is weird. We just recently came up with it, but really native culture includes science, philosophy, art, you know, culture, language. It's all so integrated that they had to come up with a different name, these names just to help us understand what they do. Yeah. So um, we like to have the indigenous perspective because sure. in terms of what I think is our hope too for the future is to see more of indigenous worldview in understanding the universe mm -hmm. come back into our lives because they have a lot of understanding that we need right now because they know how to live in harmony with nature because of that worldview because they don't see things as separate and uh, yeah so that's an important part of the work is to bring that philosophy in as an integrated subject. Yes, yes, yes. I think that's a beautiful way of uh, finishing our conversation in terms of giving, uh, coming back to the origins of, uh, uh, because we are all natives. Mm -hmm. That's something that sometimes our societies forget. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's a way of like a, an eternal return to the basic or to the basis and to the future that is always in a secret. Mm -hmm. And we all think about progress, and sometimes we forget that progress, sometimes it's yeah, coming back mm -hmm. and to mm -hmm. reset things as, uh, yeah, that's very nice. Yeah. And if you ever have, um, if one, anyone has a, a commentary or a, a, a question, oh, there's... Uh, it was a lovely conversation. I really enjoyed to hear all the perspectives from philosophy, science, art, 
My question was about the process of creation of Space Messenger. Um, the fact that is one of the core elements of the installation is message, it's language. Um, the process of the creation of the piece was motivated by the pandemics because you had to talk a lot uh, through Zoom, I suppose, and, and through mediated communication. And as Steven said, when you try to make a public uh, science engagement or science education, the practical part, the hands on, is very important to motivate the kids. But in this case, you are using words to send message to, to the future. That part of the, oh, uh, as putting in other words, the, the core practical part, the hands on, it's letters, is messages. Have you ever think about that? It's more a commentary. <laughs> Thank you very much. You want to respond to that? The, can you respond? Why we chose messages, why the, the relationship between letters and, and words to communicate the science, is that the question? Why you? Oh, oh, oh. Well, okay, so messages are one of the many ways that are, exp that are explored in the workshop. But I do have a fascination with words and, and language. Uh, I developed the language program before I developed this. So the, and it and actually was very, very interesting to see them use language to write their messages. So they do actually use their silhouettes and express themselves with silhouettes in other ways. Um, but the core space messages is because uh, it's the message is to, commu to get, give them a voice, to communicate their, um, their ideas to the future, of the future, and for people mm -hmm. to be able to very simply respond. And if you're gonna do something participatory and you want everyone to be able to participate, it's gotta be simple. And if you make it too complicated, then it's hard for everyone to participate. So one of the ways that people can, can contribute is even using their WhatsApp and SMS. And we have many ways that anybody can send a message. It's the old like message in a bottle kind of a concept. And, and it's age old and anybody can relate to it. And sending messages into space. Also, um, well, you know what else inspired it was Nicole, uh, one of our uh, collaborators. She's an astrophysicist, and there's a new field in astronomy uh, called uh, multi-messenger astronomy. That was actually the inspiration for the name because she explains that photons, neutrons, every particle has their own message that they communicate to us. When we, when we see them through instruments, we see, we see the photon or the, the neutron through whatever instrument we use, they're sending us messages. And when she said that to me, it really um, inspired me, multi-messenger particles. And so I thought, well, we're like multi-messenger messengers, you know, sending our unique vision of the world. So there was something about the idea of messages that inspired it. I have to say that the trickiest part from the scientific point of view was when Agnes asked me to go into the future to respond to these <laughs> messages, and, and I'll be trying that, but I haven't yet achieved that. Good question. Thank you. <laughs> I've forgotten about that. It was a year ago. <laughs> so, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. I That's hope you will have you all have enjoyed this conversation about science and art, but in a specific point of view with a specific project that has linked a scientist and an artist that have collaborated and that we all can be part of um, since not tomorrow, I said tomorrow, but I forgot that today is Wednesday, so Friday, Saturday, Friday Sunday. Saturday and Sunday from uh, 7 dawn, from dark, dark until 10 30 till 10.30, okay, uh -huh. at, the, at the central patio. Please don't um, miss it. You are going to love it. And if so. for any reason you cannot make it, you can go to spacemessengers.com and we're gonna live stream it. And you can see the live stream and then we're, you're gonna see mes the messages that are being projected. You'll see them on the website. 
and then there's a little space for you to put your own message and send it out to us. So, but hopefully you'll come in person. So it's a participatory, even online. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you, Katarina. Thank you. Oeiras, 46 km quadrados de ideias e emoções com que damos forma ao futuro. Oeiras 27.